So now, what about when we have systems of charges that are not uh, all aligned along the same axis? So suppose, actually let me make that a little bit more straight. Suppose we have a coordinate system here. All right, and I'm going to put a charge right here, and I'm going to put a charge right here. And let's make this one a positive charge, and we'll make this one a negative charge. Okay, um, and let's give these values while we're at it. So let's let this maybe be 3 coulombs, and let's let this maybe be 2 coulombs. And I want to determine, we're going to stick with the origin as our point P, where we're trying to evaluate the field. So I want to evaluate what the field at point P is going to be. All right, I want to evaluate what the field due to these two charges at point P is going to be. And again, we can do this using the superposition principle. So all we have to do is compute the electric field from both charges, and then we're going to add them together. But in this case, we have to add them together vectorially. Now, technically, in the previous video, we still did it vectorially, but when everything is in one dimension, uh, vector uh, algebra just simply means uh, keeping track of your plus and minus signs. Whereas here, we're actually going to have to dive into a little bit of trigonometry. So the, the formal statement of the problem is to find the electric field magnitude and direction of the electric field at the origin of this coordinate system with these two charges. Now, of course, to complete the problem, we have to know what the distances are. So let's just go ahead and uh, let this three uh, Coulomb charge, uh, let's let this be uh, two meters, for example, from the origin, and we'll let this two Coulomb charge be one meter from the origin, okay? Now, what, um, are the directions of the electric fields from these charges at the origin. So if I look at the uh, positive charge, uh, going down the y-axis, we know that the electric fields, the field lines, are going to be pointing away from the charge. So at point P, this 3 Coulomb charge is going to contribute a, a field that is in the negative y direction. Okay, so the field from the um, uh, 3 Coulomb charge is going to be in the negative y direction. And the field from the um, 2 Coulomb charge is of course going to be pointing toward the charge. Right, And so at the origin, we see that it's in the plus x direction. So the field from the 2 Coulomb charge, the field from the 2 Coulomb charge is going to be in the positive x direction. So what that means vectorially is I have a vector in the negative y direction and a vector in the uh, positive x direction. So I'm expecting uh, my overall field to be down here in, in quadrant number four, okay, at the end of the day. Um, so that is what we are expecting, all right? We're expecting the field to be in the uh, fourth quadrant, all right? So now let's actually go about computing these. And um, let's come back up here, and and let's um, let's call this Q1, just because it's going to be uh, a little bit simpler, and we'll call this Q2. Okay. So with that in mind, we've got the first field is of course going to be equal to k, absolute value q1, over r1 squared. And 
this time we'll actually plug in the numbers. And of course, K is going to be, uh, I won't bother writing it all out because it's going to take time, um, <clears throat> but I'll, I'll put it in the calculation. So this is, of course, going to be K times uh, 3 coulombs divided by uh, 2 meters quantity squared. And again, K has the value 9 times 10 to the 9th. And if I plug this into my calculator, I get 6.75 times 10 to the 9th uh, newtons per coulomb. Okay, and <clears throat> so this is going to be in the negative y direction. All right, and for our second field, this is going to have the value k uh, times two micro or uh, two coulombs rather, divided by one meter squared. And this is going to be 1.8 times 10 to the 10th newtons per coulomb. All right. So um, just a little under three times as much. So let's let's come back here. Why is this? Okay. So why is Q2 why is Q2 here? Uh, why is the field going to be, uh, you know, almost three times as much as the field from uh, Q1? Well, Q1 has a charge that's one and a half times as large, but the distance between Q2 and the point we're interested in is um, twice as close. And when I square that, that's going to give me a factor of four. And so the factor of four from the inverse square uh, behavior of, of uh, the electric field is going to overtake the uh, fact that the uh, charge on Q1 has a larger quantity uh, in magnitude than uh, charge two. So that is why that is going to be bigger. And again, this is going to be in the plus X direction. Okay, so now that we've got that, we can make a new axis and we can draw our components here um, and so let's see this is going to be something like this this is E2 while E1 is going to be something like this, about a third, right? And so the resultant is then going to be right about here, right? So that's my overall electric field. Okay, is that vector right there. So now we can compute the magnitude and we'll also compute uh, this angle right here. So we're going to compute the magnitude and we'll compute that angle. Okay, and so the magnitude is of course going to be found from the Pythagorean theorem. And when I plug in these numbers, this is going to be 6.75 times 10 to the ninth squared plus, imagine that this is still under the square root, um, 1.8 times 10 to the tenth, also squared. And when I take the square root, this gives me 1.92 times 10 to the 10th. Right? 
So that takes care of the magnitude. Now what about the direction? Okay, what about the direction? Well, the direction, we're going to use the tangent function. So if I use this angle right here, and I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll, we'll see why I use that angle here in just a moment. Because if I can find the angle between the negative y-axis and my resultant, then all I have to do is add 270 to that to get the total angle from the x-axis, which is the uh, typical convention. Right. Now you can find this angle and say it's with respect to the negative y-axis, um, but it's, it's, it's typical convention to find it from the x-axis. But in any case, if I use the um, tangent function and make this a right triangle, right, what I see is that my E1 is the adjacent side to the angle, and my E2 is the opposite side. So I'm going to say tangent I'm going to say tangent of theta is equal to E2 over E1. And note that I don't have to really worry about things that are positive and negative in this case. All I'm interested in is the magnitude, and that's just going to give me this angle. right? And then I'm just going to add uh, 270 to that once I find this. So then we'll take the inverse tangent. Theta is going to be the inverse tangent. Of E2 over E1. And that's going to give me 69.4 degrees. Okay, so my total angle is going to be 270 plus that. Right, so my total angle this is going to be 270 plus 69.4. Right, uh, so that's going to give me, what, uh, 339.4. So my total angle is 339.4 degrees. Right, and let's make that forward just a little bit better. Okay, so we found the magnitude, uh, 1.92 times 10 to the 10th newtons per coulomb, and we found the angle, um, and that is how you do it. So once again, it's up to you to define uh, the direction of the field based on how the charge is oriented and how the field lines are either emanating from or terminating on that particular charge. So that's why we do the absolute values in the uh, force Coulomb's law as well as the electric field equation because you have to then specify the direction, right? The direction is not going to necessarily be specified uh, based on whether the charge is negative or positive. You have to know how it's oriented with respect to the position that you're measuring the field at, okay? Um, so I hope that that was helpful and we will see you next time.